Welcome, welcome to the case study. My name is Dave Coker. In this case study, we're going to talk about portfolio theory. We're going to ask a very important question. Is, is diversification overrated? In order to answer that question, we're going to come up with another question. How are you creating value as you go about your business today? And when we, at, when we complete this, this case study, what we're going to do is we're going to understand the benefits of diversification. And we're going to talk about diversification in a way that will help you understand not only what diversification does for a portfolio or a collection of investable assets, but what diversification cannot do. Diversify is, is, diversification is sort of overrated in the sense that some investors think that you only need diversification if you don't really understand what you're doing. And this is a, an interesting quote from Warren Buffett. Diversification is only required when investors do not understand what it is they're doing. And of course, Warren Buffett's one of the most famous investors of the 20th century. Very competent, very professional, exceptional returns. What are some of the goals of diversification? Well, we know that any asset we can invest, any, any, any asset that we might choose to put into a portfolio, has two components of return. One is what we call specific, and that's the return that that uh, asset itself generates. The other one is systemic, and systemic is the return of the entire market. Uh, the, the expression, a rising tide raises all boats, comes to mind. When we put the two together, we've got something very interesting going on, because as we assemble assets into our portfolio, the specific risks, risk that accompanies each of these unique assets, the idiosyncratic risk, if you want to call it that, alpha in the capital asset pricing model, the specific risk actually may counter, its, counter each other out if we choose the assets correctly. And if we go about this properly, as we add assets to a portfolio, the specific risk is reduced, 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 until the entire portfolio achieves what we call the systemic or the market risk, the market rate of return. We've got a very interesting graph here that you want to look at because we know that adding shares, pardon me, adding shares or adding assets, I should say, to a portfolio reduces specific risk. But it's impossible to reduce your exposure down below the market level of risk. It just isn't going to happen. Now, academics debate this, whether the number of appropriate assets to put into a portfolio is 2, 4, 6, 8, you know, 100, 200. It doesn't really matter how many there are. It's widely open to debate whether the number of assets in the portfolio, uh, what the optimal number of assets in a portfolio is to actually reduce your risk. So now, in order to answer this question, is diversification overrated? Really what we should do is understand, try to understand the goals of diversification. What are we trying to do when we diversify a portfolio? Well, we know when we assemble assets into a portfolio, each asset has two factors that drive return. First of all, there's market or systemic type of return, and that's the return irrespective of any return that asset generates. The second is mar pardon me, specific return, uh, alpha and beta in the kappa model. And when we look at these in terms of risk, we can, we can see that the, each asset we assemble in the portfolio brings with it a certain amount of market risk that can't be diversified away. It's systemic. It also brings with it some specific risk, what we call asset-specific risk. And if we choose the assets in the portfolio very carefully, what we can do is as we add assets to our portfolio, our overall risk will approximate the market risk because the systemic risk will neutralize. The systemic risk will actually be neutralized on the portfolio. So an interesting question now, now that we've talked about the goals of diversification, is how much risk can actually be diversified away. Well, we would love to get the risk-free rate of return for risky assets, but it isn't going to happen. As we add shares to our portfolio, as we add investable assets to our portfolio, all we really do is reduce the specific risk. How far do we reduce it? Where does it go? It doesn't go down to the risk-free rate. It goes down to what we call the market risk level. In other words, we can add shares, add assets to our portfolio, we can reduce the specific risk of the portfolio, but we cannot reduce the risk below the market risk. It's just impossible to actually do that. So another question would be, how can you achieve then above market returns? If you're trying to diversify away risk, if you're only going to achieve is the market risk, why would you construct 
portfolios are risky assets to begin with. Why wouldn't you just invest in the entire market and get the market rate of return? Well, there is a simple answer to that. And really what we want to do is not diversify. What that means is you have to understand what you're doing. You have to know exactly what you're buying before you buy a security, before you make an investment. When you sell it, you have to understand exactly why you're selling that asset. Uh, when I first started working in, in, on a trading desk, my boss at Deutsche Bank at the time had an expression that he drilled into us. Plan your trade, then trade your plan. So when you're working professionally managing money, you're not buying assets or selling assets willy-nilly. You plan out your entry point. You plan out your exit point. You purchase at a certain point in time. You sell at a certain point in time. You plan your trade, and then you trade your plan. And if you really want to achieve above market risk, pardon me, above market returns, what you have to do is embrace something called concentration risk. And concentration risk, I always joke, I always like to say, learn to love it. It's volatile, it, it'll be a real roller coaster, but if you choose the assets appropriately that go into your portfolio, the risky assets, you'll reduce your, you'll reduce your, your pardon me, you'll increase your return far, far, far above the market return you'll reduce your unexpected re return because you'll be exceeding the market rate of return. And an interesting question would be, if we do embrace concentration risk, if we put our assets into a relatively small number of investable securities or whatever, uh, can, can we hedge the risk? Well, it's the answer is simple. No, you can't have it both ways. Either you have to build a, a portfolio of very risky assets, concentrate that portfolio on a relatively small number of assets, and try to achieve very, very high levels of return compared to the market, or you have to hedge down and you have to continue adding risky assets that have negative or even low correlation to your overall portfolio. Keep adding them so that you lower your risk, your specific risk, down to the market level, market rate of return. Because, guys, think about it this way. Hedging, for all intents and purposes, is insurance. That's exactly what it is. And I have contents insurance on my flat here in London. I have buildings insurance on my flat here in London. I'm not getting that for free. Insurance costs. Hedging, a form of insurance, costs. Hedging, like insurance, is there to protect you against the downside. But you know, something very unusual happens when you're investing, when you're building portfolios of risky assets and you're striving to achieve above market returns. Something very interesting happens because if you're not really hedged, your upside potentially is unlimited. It's very, very high. If you're hedged, you're going to achieve the market rate of return and not much more. It'll just drift along with the market. You might get a few hundred basis points above the market, but you're certainly not going to get exceptionally high returns. So another question that we'd like to ask uh, of you today is, you know, if you're diversified or you're not, think about how you're creating value for your enterprise. Now, in terms of thought leaders for this field, there's a number that I would direct you to that of, of, of people that you can actually read. And we'll be looking at this in the My MBA resource a little bit later. Markowitz, of course, in 52, with the seminal paper on, on portfolio theory and diversification. Very, very important to read. Sharp and Blythe did a very good paper in 2000. Also a very, very good to read as well. And finally, I direct you to Fabozzi and Markowitz. They did a paper in the Journal of Finance, and this will be available for you in 2002. Those are the thought leaders. So please go through and read the case, look at the panel discussion, and thank you so much. Oh, and get the papers and read those. And thank you so much for participating in this, in this program. Once again, my name is Dave Coker. The topic is portfolio theory. The question is, is it overrated?